Hello. Welcome to our third and the last lecture for, for this uh, mini course on personal geometry, Lie algebraic and Lie algebraic and Lie group it. Okay, so uh, let me start with a quick uh, reminder about what we have done during our second lecture. So in our second lecture, we went over um, properties of Poisson manifolds and we introduced the algebraids. So let's go back to definition of the algebraid just as a reminder. Here you go. Okay, so we have seen that a Lie algebraic is nothing but a vector bundle. So here I call the vector bundle A, it's a vector bundle over M that comes with a Lie bracket on uh, two sections of A and a bundle map that we call rho. Rho is an anchor map. It's a bundle map from A to uh, the tangent space of the base manifold. And we need a compatibility between these two objects. So we have two objects, a Lie bracket on sections of A and a bundle map rho, which is the anchor map. So now we need a compatibility condition between these two. So the compatibility condition is given by this relation here. So the compatible condition is that if we take two sections of A, the X and Y are smooth sections of A, and we take a function, a smooth function on the base manifold M, if you multiply this smooth section with uh, Y, we get another section of A. So now we take the Lie bracket of X and FY. So the Lie bracket of X and Fy is equal to F times the Lie bracket of X and Y plus rho times X. So let me uh, rewrite this so you can see it better. So let me rewrite the compatibility condition between the Lie bracket sections of A and uh, the income map. So if we take X, a section of A, we take F, a function multiplied with another section of A, then this leap bracket is equal to F times XY plus rho of X. So rho of X is a vector field. Now this work for x will, uh, will act on the function f and then times y. So this is our compatibility condition. So a Lie algebraic is a vector bundle A over M that comes with a Lie bracket on sections of A and a bundle map from A to Tm which satisfies some compatibility condition. So we have seen examples. Let me very quick go over this example. The first example is just to take a finite dimensional Lie algebra. So any finite dimensional Lie algebra is a Lie algebra over a single point. So the base manifold is a single point, so zero dimensional. And we take the anchor map to be the zero map. So this means that finite dimensional Lie algebras are Lie algebra over a single point. So another example here, which is um, very important is if you take any smooth uh, manifold and we look at its tangent bundle. So its tangent bundle is, has a natural or uh, the other boy structure. So we take the anchor map as being the identity map and the Lie bracket on sections of TM. So sections of um, the tangent bundle are vector fields. So the Lie bracket on vector fields is the usual uh, Lie bracket on vector fields. And we know that we can take 
the leaf record of two vector fields. So this is the usual leaf record on vector field. So Lee Du Bois are generalizations of gradient models and finite dimensional geometries. But another example, which is also very important, is that if you take a Poisson manifold, then its cotangent bundle has a natural um, Lee Du Bois structure with the anchor map is the pi shaft. The pi shaft is the anchor map. And here I give you last time the um, Lee bracket on sections of T star M, which is just, uh, so by sections of T star M, we mean uh, one forms. So we take the leaf bracket of two one forms and we get another one form. All right, so another example is bundles of Lie algebras. So there are many examples we have seen, we have seen four, five examples, six examples, I'm not gonna come back to all of them. Uh, we're gonna, uh, so at the R algebraic also we have seen it. So we're gonna go very fast on this. And an important proposition is that the anchor map of any uh, Lie algebraic is a Lie algebraic homomorphism. So this we proved this last time. And I think this is where we stopped. All right, so today we're gonna uh, come back to uh, Lie algebraic and we're gonna see that Lie algebraic are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, five-wise linear Poisson structures. So first of all, what is five-wise linear Poisson structure? So we start with a vector bundle P. So P is a vector bundle over M. So I need a couple of definitions before I can define five-wise linear Poisson structures. So start with a vector bundle uh, E over M and P is a projection map. So a function on E into a space is said to be basic if it has a form G composed with P. So this means that your function is constant on the five. That's what it means. For a function on E to be basic, it must be constant on the fiber. Okay, so this is F must be of this form. Now, F would be said to be fiber wise linear if its restriction to each fiber is linear. So let me remind you that the fiber, if I have a, our vector bundle, lives like this. So if this is my M and then I take a point here, so the fiber here is a linear vector space. And we say that F is fiber-wise linear if its restriction to uh, each fiber is a linear function. Okay, now we have the tools we need to define the fiber-wise linear Poisson structure. So here is the definition. So let's find the a Poisson structure on the total space of a vector bundle E over M. Then we'll say that phi is fiberwise linear if it satisfies the following conditions. So phi is a Poisson tensor. It corresponds to a Poisson bracket. So we say that phi is fiberwise linear if the Poisson bracket of two fun basic functions is basic. So this is the fiberwise Poisson. The Poisson bracket of two basic functions is a basic function. And the Poisson bracket of two fiberwise linear functions is a fiberwise linear function. And finally, the Poisson bracket of a basic function and a fiberwise linear function is fiber is basic. Okay, so two basic functions, their Poisson bracket is basic. Two fiberwise linear Poisson, linear functions, the Poisson bracket is fiberwise linear. One basic and one fiberwise linear function. You take the Poisson bracket, you get something basic. 
All right, so this is what we need. If you have this type of Poisson bracket, we say that the Poisson bracket is clockwise linear. So remember that this is defined on the total space of a vector space. Okay, so now we have the theorem here. So given A, a vector bundle, so there is a one to one correspondence between the algebra, the algebraic structures on A and clockwise linear Poisson structures on the dual of A. Here, let me come to this. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the algebraic structures on A and Otherwise, in the Poisson structures on the dual of A. All right, so we have to prove this. And the proof goes as follows. So start with uh, Lear de Boyd, A over M. Yeah, take the dual bundle of A. So now we're gonna, um, define our Poisson bracket on A star, we define it as follows. So if I have a function on M, so a function of M would be a basic function on A star. As I said, for a function to be basic on A star, you just need this function to be constant on the values. So if I have a function on M, I can look at it as a basic function on a star. So f and g are function on m, and I define the bracket to be zero. If I take alpha, a section of a, a section of a can be viewed as a fiberwise linear function on a star. Okay. So now the first one bracket of alpha, which is a section of a, and a function on M is just taking rho of alpha, give you a vector field acting on F. So you get a function on M, which is basic. And now finally, the Poisson bracket of two sections of A viewed as otherwise linear functions on A star is nothing but the Lie bracket of alpha and beta. So viewed as fibrous linear function on A star. Okay, so this expression, they completely define the Poisson bracket on A star. Indeed, you can just uh, take a local coordinate and to get a local coordinate for A star, you need a local coordinate for the base manifold and a basis for A. Okay, so this is a system of local coordinate on um, A star. So uh, the basic coordinate function are functions on M and alpha one, alpha R, this is a basis for A and you apply this, therefore you get local uh, expression of your bracket. And for a bracket, Poisson bracket is enough to be able to define it locally everywhere to see what, I mean, to completely define your uh, Poisson bracket. So this expression here completely define uh, the fiberwise Poisson bracket on A star. Now, conversely, so if you want here to write down the local expression of our Poisson tensor, we can write it this way. So now conversely, if we start with a fiberwise linear Poisson bracket on A star, we therefore obtain a Lie bracket on A by just coming back to, uh, I mean, we define the Lie bracket using uh, 
this expression here. So if I take alpha beta two element of our um, vector bundle, uh, two sections of our vector bundle A, then since I know this part here, this Lie bracket, so it corresponds to an element of a section of A, and this section would be the Lie bracket. And we define the anchor map just using this expression here. So a fiberwise linear Poisson bracket on the dual of any vector bundle give us a Lie algebraic structure on A. Okay, we know fiberwise linear uh, Poisson bracket on A star, then we immediately get a Lie algebraic structure on A using this expression here. All right, so uh, now this is about homomorphism, but I think I'm going to skip homomorphism. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip homomorphism because we won't have time. So the, the main goal here is to define the algebraic. I'm going to right, right now go to uh, the algebraics. Uh, sorry, Lie groupoids, uh, because that's the uh, main objective in this third lecture is to understand Lie groupoids. So Lie groupoids are generalization of Lie groups. And what they do is they describe some symmetry properties of certain geometric objects. I will not give details about this, but uh, groupoids were introduced by Eris Lang as tools in topology and uh, differential geometry. But first of all, before we um, say more about groupoids, so let's look at the definition. What is a groupoid? Okay, so the definition of groupoid involves a couple of uh, objects. So first we need two sets, non-empty sets. We need two non-empty sets. So we need two non-empty sets, G and M. And the first set is called the set of arrows. And the second one is called the set of units. So you can think of G, the set of arrows, as really, uh, as I said, arrows. So any arrow will start from a point and ends to another point. Okay, so you need the end points and uh, the starting point. But one should think about these arrows as not lying on the base manifold M, not manifold at the base space. I mean the space of unit M, but lying outside of M. So let's look at a picture here. Um, so we look at M. M is this here. I represent M here. So this is my M. And as I said, I look at arrows, but these arrows are outside M. So for our first arrow, we have, let me erase this and do it again. So we have an arrow that goes from X to Y. It goes from X to Y. So it be oriented, of course, because it tells you what is the starting point. It goes from X to Y. Okay. And this is an element of uh, G. the base point, which is X, the starting point and the end point are in M. So this gives us a map, source map. So for each element of G, it's source. So here it takes G and source of G here is X.
And also you have the target map that takes, so it's element G has the target, the target here for G, this target is Y. Okay, so this is the starting point of your arrow and the end point of your arrow. The starting point and the end point will be on your uh, unit set M. So the definition will involve these two maps, but also you have a multiplication map. So if I take two elements of G, in order to be able to multiply them, they need to satisfy some condition here. So for example, uh, I take the first one, this is G1, G1 start from X1, ends at Y1, and G2 starts from X2 and ends at Y2. In order to be able to multiply this, you need the end point of the first one to be equal to the starting point of the second one, and then you can multiply them. Okay. So I look at this G2 here, which is the set of all uh, pairs such that uh, the source of G2 is equal to the target of G1. And this is where the multiplication is defined. You can multiply two elements of G only if they satisfy this condition here. If they are element of G2. So another ingredient that we need is the inverse map. So any element can be inversed. You have inverse of the element. So let's say our G that we started with, so its inverse would be G inverse. It's the arrow that goes from Y to X. Okay, if G goes from X to Y, G inverse goes from Y to X. So this is the inverse map. And last, so we have uh, the injection map here. To X, we assign an element of uh, G. So the element of G is such that uh, it's a source and its target are the same point X. All right, so now let us define. So we have the ingredient that we need here to uh, define the map. So this ingredient are needed. So we need the source map, the target map, the multiplication map, inverse map, and epsilon, which is injection of M into um, G. So now we can define what a group weight is. So this data define a group weight if the following conditions are satisfied. First, we need the associativity condition. So meaning that if I take three elements that are uh, where we can multiply them. So I have um, G1, G2. So G1, G2, G3 belongs to, I'm gonna call it G sub three here, meaning that uh, the multiplication that I'm talking about is well divided. So what that means is that we have this condition here. So uh, the target of G1 is equal to the source of G2. This will allow me to multiply these two. Now, when you multiply M1 and M2, you get an element of G whose source point will be the source of M1 and the target will be the target of M3. Now we, sorry, the target will be the target of G2. 
Now, in order to be able to multiply uh, this element here, which is G1, G2 with G3, you need the target of G2 to be equal to the source of G3. So this, then this multiplication makes sense. And when we multiply this, we want to be the same as this multiplication here. So basically what we want is, um, try to put it here. We have here G1, and here we have G2, and here we have G3. So this is X, Y, Z, and T. All right, so this is what allow us to be able to multiply this. This, this condition here that I uh, highlight in yellow. All right, so now another condition that we need is the second condition here about units. So if I multiply um, the target of G, let me see, I think I write it. Uh, twice. Yep. We need this condition here. And the last condition is, I mean, the fourth condition is this, that we have a unit inverse for any G, there is a unit inverse. Now this condition that I write here, this four is the same as uh, two, so you don't need it here. So let me remove, let me remove this one, maybe. Yeah, let me remove this one. And change the notation here, oops. Yes, so uh, this is the definition of a group weights. Now we can put some um, more structures on this group weight, but before we do that, let me just uh, go over this remark. So the entire group weight structure can be encoded in uh, the graph of your multiplication. So graph of your multiplication tells you everything. Okay, what is the graph? So the graph is a set of pairs G1, G2 that, are, that can be multiplied. Okay, and then you take the third element to be the multiplication of G1 and G2. Okay, so you can get the unit of the unit elements of uh, the group weight by taking uh, elements of G satisfying this condition. Oops. Okay, and you can take, you can get the source, you can get the target, and so on. I'm not going to emphasize this, but let's look at more, look at the examples just to keep in mind what, I mean, to help us to better understand what uh, the group weight is. So the first example is the example of groups. Sorry, I say the group. No. What is a group weight? Okay, up to now we did not define a league group weight. No. So what is a group weight? Let me come back here. What we define is a group weight, a group weight. So uh, what is the first example of a group weight? So a group is a group weight with only one single unit element. Okay, there is only one unit element. And here, of course, the unit element can be, can, because it's a unit, you can call it E. So the neutral element. And the source and the target map will be constant mapped because you have only one element on uh, Okay, so 
m right so source in target will be constant noise all right now another interesting uh example is the pair groupoid so this will help you to better understand this uh, concept of groupoid so take any non-empty set So take any non-empty set. Oops. Take any non-empty set E, and take the Cartesian product of E with itself. So this will be a set of arrows. Now, a set of units. M is just the diagonal of G. So M is the set of points, the diagonal of G. So these are pairs of the form XX when X is an element of E. And we define the source map to be equal to this map here. So if I have two, a pair XY, then the source of XY will be XX. The target of xy will be yy. The inverse of xy will be yx. And you can multiply xy with yz to get xz. Of course, this diagonal is immersed okay, in g. You have an immersion from m to G. All right, so this is a very simple and uh, helpful example, the pair group wave. Now we're gonna define a topological group wave here, yes, and there is something missing. So a topological group wave is a topological space, uh, okay. We have G and M will be topological space. Okay, so a topological groupoid is a groupoid where G is a topological space, M is a topological space. M it must be housed off. Means you can separate two points of M. I have two parts of M, I can find two uh, uh, neighborhoods of these points that are disjoint, it's housed off. But G might not be housed off, might be housed off or not. G might be housed off or not. Okay, it's not necessary house, but M is necessary house. And what we want is to see, because we have topological space, of course, we want all the uh, source map, target map, uh, unit section, epsilon, and the inverse map to be continuous. So the source maps are also uh, subjective. So they're subjective source and target are subjective continuous maps, multiplication and unit section continuous. But uh, what we want for the inverse map, so we want this inverse map to be a uh, homeomorphism. So this is what we want. So we have a groupoid, there was in the notion of groupoid, there was no um, topological object, so it was not a topological space. Now we add some topological space and we want this structure maps to be um, 
continues. Okay, finally, now we can define a Lie groupoid. What is a Lie groupoid? It's a topological groupoid for which all the, uh, first we want, before we talk about the such maps, so we want M and G to be manifold. So G is a manifold, but G is not necessarily housed of. M is a housed of manifold. Now we want the source and the target to be smooth surjective submergence. We want the multiplication map and epsilon to be smooth maps, while the inverse map is a diffeomorphism. Okay. So all the structure maps are smooth maps. And the set of units is a manifold, which is housed of, while the set of arrows is a manifold, which is not necessarily housed of. All right, so this is the definition of Lie group A. At first, it sounds a little bit complicated, but if you play or you see example, you will see that you already encoded. You, you have seen many uh, Lie group ways without knowing these are Lie group ways. So the first example is just a Lie group. So a Lie group is a Lie group way where your base manifold is just a single point. It has one unit element. So in general, for a Lie group where you have infinitely many um, unit elements. So the set of units is a manifold. But if your set of unit is a zero dimensional manifold with one single point, then you have a Lie group. All right, now another example is uh, you start with M being a smooth manifold and you look at the pair group or the pair group that we defined earlier, okay? This pair group is the source. So of course the pair group here, you have M cross M. So the source and the target map will, will be uh, submergence. Subjective submergence. So the multiplication, you can multiply x, y with y, z to get x, z. Smooth. The inverse, you take the inverse of x, y is y, x. This application is smooth too. And finally, you have epsilon of x, y, and the epsilon of x, x. Which as an element of, uh, uh, yeah, of g is x, x. Because m is equal to, I mean, the, uh, you have the diagonal of the Cartesian product with M of M, so delta M is the set of all X, X, X in M. And this is the base manifold for your um, group it for your pair group it. All right, now we're gonna see another example, which is very uh, important here, the fundamental group is. So start with any uh, smooth made for M. And you look at homotopy classes of passes relative to some fixed point. So if I have two fixed point, I look at all passes, continuous passes going from X to Y and I consider homotopy classes of these um, passes. 
Okay, so gamma here is a set the pass. I will consider the smooth pass, the smooth pass from uh, x to y. And I look at all from the classes of, of this um, pass. Okay, so multiplication of passes are combination of passes. And we can have the inverse of a pass. The pass from x to y has an inverse from y to, to x and so on. Okay. So phi m is the group word that we define using the homotopy classes of passes. And it's related to the pair group for it. So you can define the map that goes from phi m to the pair group for it. If you have a class, the homotopy class of uh, x, you can take the endpoints here to give you a pair in the pair group for it. And this map here is a local diffeomorphism. It's a local diffeomorphism and it becomes a global diffeomorphism when M is simply connected. Okay, I'm gonna give another example, maybe the last example, uh, the action group for it. So suppose you have a Lie group H acting on a smooth manifold M. So the action here is given by this. So let's call this action uh, lambda here. So it takes an element of your group and an element of M and then the action is given this way. All right, so uh, you can, so here in my example, I define uh, a left action. So you can also define a right action if you want to. So now take G to be equal to the Cartesian product H cross M. And you define the source map, the source of uh, H X the pair is equal to X. And the target is equal to this element here. Now you can define also epsilon. Epsilon X is equal to the pair of E and X where here E is the neutral element, the unit neutral element of H. And the inverse of H X have a pair is equal to H inverse. And here you have H acting on X. Okay, so this is what we call the transformation group point. So we use the notation, you can use this notation for left action and this notation for right action, depending on what you want. Okay, but this is, so uh, G, this, this target map in this uh, source map is the legal way. All right, now we're going to look at some properties of Lie group voids. Uh, so I think I will skip this left hand variant and right hand variant. So I will skip this uh, for the moment. We find isotropy Lie group in orbit. All right, so what is isotropy Lie group? So suppose you start with a Lie group for it, G, oops. 
suppose you start with a lead group of T with source S and target T. So I can look at these fibers. So these are the P image. So S of G is an element of M. I take P image. So this is a source fiber. And this one is a target fiber. So this will be submanifolds of our set of uh, arrows. And these are submanifolds of the dimension, dimension of G minus dimension of M. Why? Because the source and the target are submergence. Now, if I take the intersection, if I take an X, which is, so I start with X, in M, and I take the source fiber intersection with the target fiber. This is a Lie group. It's a Lie group which is called the isotopy Lie group. Another important object is uh, the orbits. So the orbits. I take an element of G and look at its uh, target. Now take all sources of G so that you can satisfy this element here. So the condition is that the target of G is equal to X. Okay, and then you take the source. So if you look at this, you get an orbit of X. So orbits of X sits inside M. And they form a partition, the orbits of M. They form a partition of M. It's a partition into immersed connected submanifold, so we get a smooth foliation. So if I start with a group of G on the set of units, set of units I have a foliation. Okay, so we are running out of time, but I can uh, say a few words about the bisections. So what is a bisection of a group voyage? So this bisection, bisection is a submanifold of the manifold of arrows for which we have these two conditions. If I restate the source map on this submanifold, I get different morphism. If I restrict the target map on this manifold, I get a different morphism. So the restriction, these two restrictions are different morphism. And what is important about this is that if I look at the space of bisections of a group for it, lead group for it, this is a group. So we can define, so group, we can define the multiplication of the group, define it this way. Okay, so we are running out of time. I have to um, summarize a little bit what we have seen in these three uh, lectures. Let me um, try to give a picture on this. Okay, so we started with uh, Synthetic manifolds. Yeah, synthetic manifolds are some specific cases of Poisson manifold.
Now, after this section, we went to look at uh, the algevoids. So inside the set of the algevoids, you have your Lie groups. So in Lie algebra, finite dimensional Lie algebra. Okay, so finite dimensional Lie algebras are Lie algebras, but also you have a tangent bundles of smooth manifolds. Now we have seen that this. Let me rewrite this bigger. So we have seen that inside this set of parcel manifold, we have uh, another set. So let me, there might be an intersection. Let me write it this way. We have here fiber-wise linear. Poisson structures from vector bundle. Okay, and we know that these two they are in one to one correspondence. So these two are in one to one correspondence. So this means that the algebraic are specific types of uh, Poisson manifolds. Person manifolds, specific type of person manifolds. And then we have seen Lie groupoids. Now, Lie groupoids, they are related to uh, Lie algebraids. As you know, if I have any Lie group, then I can attach this Lie group of Lie algebra. Of course, find the dimension of Lie algebra. And this will be the same for, um, I won't have time to go over this, maybe during the uh, following session, we can do that. So if I have any Lie group, if I look at the set of left invariant uh, vector fields, then this gives me a Lie algebra. So there is a Lie algebra associated to every Lie group. That's why you have only one way. But not all Lie, Lie group weights, they come from Lie algebra. So you have only one word. Okay, so basically this is um, the link between what we, the three uh, topics that we covered. So maybe I will have time to tell a little bit more about it during our following sessions. Yeah, but with three hours, I won't have enough time to cover this. I need at least a semester to cover these three uh, topics. So, but I hope that you um, get the picture, the big picture. So my intention was, was intended to uh, introduce, to have a, a gentle introduction to this area. And uh, I hope you uh, get the big picture. All right, so I think we can uh, stop here. So I will see you during the uh, forum sessions. Okay, bye-bye.